Well, it changed significantly, I would say. You know, there's a lot more responsibility in it, obviously. Um, but uh, this is something that I've mentioned, I've been preparing for my entire life, and I'm excited uh, about the new challenges that are uh, um, ahead. Avery Johnson's now the quarterback moving forward. What have you seen from him since he kind of took the reins over? A ton of maturity, and really I didn't necessarily see all of that when he took the reins over the Monday after the Iowa State loss. Um, you've seen it since he's stepped foot on campus, and uh, his desire to learn, his desire to compete. We all know what kind of athlete he is, what kind of football player that he is but uh, the character of who he is and um, what type of competitor he is, uh, that's, that's exactly what we anticipated uh, going into that bowl game. And you brought in Easton Kilty along the offensive line. What's the thought behind that? What do you envision his role being? Well, Easton um, comes from a very good program uh, up north, and you could see – on his film, what kind of player, what kind of competitor he is. The versatility that he brings to the offensive line, I think, is really important. And with us losing uh, the three starters from the entirety of the season, and including Christian Duffy, having that experience and um, having that uh, skill set that he has is going to be um, very, very big for us here moving forward someone like Coach Wells to the staff, uh, how's that impacted you in the offensive? Approach? Significantly, you know, not only from his experience uh, as an offensive coordinator previously, but also his experience as a head coach and his experience of having that vantage point from a number of different chairs, from a position coach to a coordinator to a head coach. Uh, to obviously being in our league a year ago, I think is extremely beneficial. Uh, he's just an absolute joy to be around. Quite honestly, Fitzy, we've just begun digging into the football aspect of it because previous three weeks we've obviously been on the road recruiting. So I'm just really excited about this month of February to see uh, what kind of additional value that he can bring to the offense. How does a, a new offensive coordinator go about constructing a playbook? Yeah. You know, that's an interesting question, <coughs> probably more so for a new offensive coordinator who is coming in from maybe a different system. The system that we currently have in place has been a system that we have used since 2013, since I arrived at North Dakota State, and it's just continually evolved through the number of different coordinators that we've had from – Brent Began to Tim Polisek to Courtney Messingham to most recently, obviously, Colin Klein. So I don't know that you're going to see significant changes. Each coordinator has put their own spin on the offense, and we are using very, very similar terminology. We're going to use a lot of the same things that we have done. The things that we have done these previous two years are not a ton different than what we have been doing um, since my time with Coach Climbing, uh, all the way going back. Do you find yourself watching your film or a game or and saying, "Oh, I'm stealing that"? Oh, I've been doing that since <laughs> since I started coaching. Yeah, Fitzy, it's it's, uh, and you can see um, even over the course of uh, uh, my time at Kansas State, there's a lot of things that maybe uh, myself or our offensive staff. Um, have gotten credit for that uh, completely was uh, was stolen. So I wish that I could say that myself and some other coaches are really original thinkers, but quite often it is um, an evolution of something that you see. Connor, we'd spoken previously, and you mentioned that you believe that this offense could be pretty dangerous this year. I was wondering if you could just elaborate on why you believe this offense could be dangerous? Well, really where you start is the playmakers that we have returning. And you look at starting, obviously when you talk offensive football, you're going to start with the quarterback position. And I think
think it's pretty well documented of what we anticipate uh, Avery's continual growth here moving forward. But, you know, you look at the performance of DJ Gideon's this, uh, not only this past year, but especially highlighted in that bowl game. Um, from the tight end position, I think that we have some increased depth. We do have some shoes to fill, most definitely. But that's college football. And when you look back out on the perimeter um, with the advantage of getting some more reps underneath their belt, uh, guys who've been in the system a little bit longer, uh, and then the addition of a guy like Dante Cephas, I think it brings a whole new element to what we can do offensively. Now, if we could just, you know, make sure that that old line coach gets his ass in gear and gets those guys ready up front. I think that we got a chance to be pretty special. But even looking at the offensive line group, you know, I know a lot of people will make note of what we lose and rightfully so should look at what we do lose. And I'm quick to remind them that in 2021, prior to the 2022 season, we lost quite a bit as well, quite a bit of experience and uh, some great leaders and uh, some great football players. And that is the program that Coach Kleiman has set out to build here, is not a good football team um, or a great football team, but a great football program that is going to have the consistency year in and year out. And I'm excited for the personality of that offensive line group to evolve. I'm excited to see who is going to step up of the, of the course of what we're doing right now and then through spring practice. So you put all those pieces together, and it's pretty hard not to get excited. I had the privilege of meeting Dante Cephas just a little bit ago. I was curious if you might be able to give us a little insight on, on uh, Dante and um, just his playmaking ability, his personality, what you've picked up from him so far. Yeah, well, his personality is very businesslike. In fact, you know, we had a quick staff meeting this morning and, and really highlighted some of the players that are really attacking the workouts, and his name came up. And you look at his background, um, he's had to earn everything that he's gotten. And he's gone through his own adversity, the adversity of what uh, maybe not his transition – to his last school being what he anticipated. Uh, he was a guy that, that we were looking to a year ago because of his relationship with Coach Middleton and the production that we saw, uh, geez, in just crossover film. You know, they played Oklahoma in 2022 before we did, and you're sitting there watching the film going, who are these guys? And uh, um, that production over a course of time when you talk to coaches who've competed and played against them and they say that that is one of the top wide receivers that they'd seen over the course of so many years of coaching in this league I think it really speaks volumes to what kind of playmaking ability he has first off just congratulations on the, the job thank you very much um, I appreciate it uh, I feel like, in general, offensive line coaches don't generally get a look at coordinator. Do you think there's uh, any kind of uh, stigma there that you're you know, mo motivated to prove that you guys can do this? Yeah, it's, it's maybe a little bit different of a track to this particular position, being an offensive line coach um, and being a coordinator. Uh, I kind of am quick to point out, I think the national champs this past year in college football had an offensive line coach as their coordinator. Um, but the stigma that comes out, and I think you guys are all well-versed in what was said in, in early December when I was named interim, was that we were going to install the triple option and we were going to um, run four, clouds, or four, four yards in a cloud of dust and, and see what happens at the end, and that's not the case at all. And I hope that that uh, bowl game proved that a little bit. Um, I am a firm believer that in order to be successful in, uh, at this level, you do have to establish the run, and vice versa. I think that you need to stop the run. But what establishing that run can ultimately do in expanding some of the things within the pass game and just a short period of time of evaluating this pass season, um, those are the things that excite me. And um, we need to be explosive uh, on the perimeter. 
and we need to be efficient in in the passing game and we need to continue to take advantage of the things that defenses are going to give us Next year with you moving up to the – are you going to continue coaching up from, from the box full-time, you think? That is the anticipation right uh, now. With, with that move, who all is going to help you, you know, coach the offensive line from play to play? I know that's got to be a little bit of a task. Yeah, well, we're very fortunate. Um, and we kind of saw – maybe you guys noticed in that bowl game that Coach LePac uh, had moved from the, uh, the box down to the sideline. And Coach LePac obviously – his track record has shown he's a phenomenal tight ends fullbacks coach here. Uh, but his background is off also in the offensive line. So having uh, a coach with his background, with his experience on the sideline, that's what's allowing me to remove myself from the sideline, move up to the booth. I'm wondering, just from a personal perspective, are you missing your seniors? Is it a little quieter without? Guys like Hayden Gillum around, and then on a more serious aspect, who has stepped up in that room as a leader? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, Gilly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I miss I miss the hell out of them, all of them, and I've had numerous phone calls, numerous FaceTimes, um, and uh, um, our relationship, and this is who I am, is going to be something that extends a lot further than just their playing career at K State. So. I miss them no different than I miss so many of the previous players that we played for. Uh, and, you know, it's – I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier of how the personality of an offensive line room will continue to evolve and it changes. And with such big personalities that we had previously, I, I told our young guys, I'm excited to see what this room looks like here moving forward. You know, it was – Noah Johnson was very dominant in 2021, and you sit there and go, gosh, dang, how are we going to fill this void? And uh, based on the player you mentioned, it was filled and then some. And uh, um, I'm just really excited because Hadley Panzer has really stepped up. Andrew Leingang has really stepped up. Um, you know, someone who's been in this program quite some time and been through so much adversity, Taylor Poitier, his name was mentioned this morning as a guy who's really impacting the people around them. So uh, as you continue to get those guys more confidence and maybe remove some of those other personalities because of graduation, um, you're really going to see that personality, that room um, take shape. And I'm, I'm really fired up about that. And that's just a few names, you know. There's, there's others that have kind of been waiting in the wings patiently. And we lost one in the transfer portal to, uh, you know, uh, what was it, uh, three six-year guys coming back. Um, but the rest stuck, stuck around. And uh, um, I'm excited to see what, uh, what they do with that room. For, for you guys at all, it's finding a transfer running back to pair with DJ at all, or are you looking at that younger crop of guys to find who's going to kind of be the next one to step up? Yeah, right now um, we feel pretty confident with where we're at in that running back room. Um, as you well know, uh, this can change so quickly. So as it stands right now, we don't see that as a direct position of need. And then you guys have a bunch of young, talented tight ends. How, now that Ben is gone, how, how are things – starting to shape up obviously if Oakley is probably top that list but behind him yeah well you know that you have uh Will Swanson who's very steady and then you have some young guys who I think I'd be in better position to answer this question probably uh in early to uh to mid-April but that's what they were recruited for you're not recruited to be a backup you're recruited to come in here and compete you're recruited to come in here and improve and bring value to this football team. And with obviously losing such a great player like Ben Sennett, um, you know, there's opportunity for those guys to really step into a role. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're excited about, but that's one of the things that we are very, very focused on here moving forward over the course of the next two and a half, three months into, into this fall. What's impressed you the most about Jacob Knuth? him taking a chance on himself, you know, 
Jacob uh, is a young man who we recruited heavily out of high school and made a decision um, to transfer here pretty well knowing who the high school quarterback was that, that we took and how he has continued to improve and step up. And one of the conversations I've had with him is to start getting comfortable being uncomfortable um, is something that you're beginning to see. And this spring, I'm really, really excited about uh, Jacob and what he can do. So um, for someone to take a chance on themselves like he did, I think is really a testament to who he is. <laughs> a lot of it will kind of shake out in the spring and fall, but uh, as far as uh, Taylor and uh, Hadley, I know kind of shared the the one guard position this year, but if I recall, Hadley also played some center uh, early on. Do you have kind of a plan for those guys? Or yeah, is that yes, we do. And really, I can tell you to the best of my knowledge is that there's open competition. And, you know, Sam Hecht is a, a young man who, similar to Jacob, came in as a walk-on who we'd recently elevated scholarship, and that's because he had earned it. And I think he is a really, really good football player. Um, you know, Andrew Leingang, who has been very, very patient, I'm really, really excited about how all of this is going to come together. And one of the things that we talk about quite often in that offensive line room, and it's easy to look at a guy like Cooper Beebe, who had played multiple positions, is the versatility is going to continue to allow you to bring value to this football team and competition to this football team. So yes, there is a absolute plan in place how that is going to shake out. Um, you know, April 15th at the conclusion of spring practice may be completely different than how it shakes out September 1st or when we kick off this season. You also talked about moving to the press box. Uh, how did how do you feel like that went? The game management, the one time you've been up there, and yeah, what did you what did you learn from that? Well, one of the things that I I needed to do was in visiting with a few other people was there's a lot of emotion that goes on the sideline and you know in my conversations I think I'd mentioned earlier of visiting with other coordinators they said you know a bad play call is better than no play call at all and uh, um, and you can you can find that out so there's so much that I did learn you know and and part of it is uh, you know got not getting stuck on the card part of it is you have a third down and six and understanding is this a sequencing opportunity you know and maybe to the surprise of a lot of people out there not every third down and six call is necessarily designed to get seven plus sometimes it's in today's age of analytical football it's to get you to a fourth and manageable um, with obviously that opportunity of getting the first down on third down so um, understanding those situations I think is a great learning experience um, in that particular that particular game, I can pinpoint a few different um, situations that you'd always like to have a play call back. You'd like to have that opportunity back. Um, as it pertains to the offensive line, it is a little bit harder to see some of the things and just pay attention to those five guys up front. And that's where it's so important to have a guy like Coach LePac, who is on the sidelines, who's going to help uh, be that extra set of eyes. So. Um, how it went. I miss being on the sideline with the guys. I'm going to be completely honest. In the second quarter, I don't know that I've shared this story, but uh, um, someone gets on the headset, and uh, shockingly, it was you know Hayden Gillum um, who says he needs to get on the headset with me. And uh, um, you know, I take my headset off and I said, "Hey, what's up?" And he just kind of wanted to see how I was doing up there and let me know that he was uh, he was missing me on the sideline. Um, so. Uh, and then kind of gave me a couple uh, couple things that he liked in there and um, uh, passed the blame on to uh, our All-American left guard on a, uh, on a particular uh, play that we ran and, um, uh, and, and laughed. I wasn't laughing quite as hard as he was, but uh, uh, 
you know, it's it's a it's really it's kind of a funny story of just I I do have a great relationship with those guys in that room and and being in that it was it was different, but uh, I know it's going to be a challenge we're going to be able to overcome. You talked about telling your quarterback to get used to being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Is that maybe the same for you in in some respects? Absolutely, it is, and um, you know. D. Scott and I were talking a little bit about it, is you sit there and you want everything to be perfect. Um, and you have a visualization of how this is all going to go um, in your life, you know, when you do get that opportunity to be a first-time play caller. And uh, it wasn't perfect. You know, you have your – I think we all know you have your leading receiver um, chose not to play in it. You have your All-American tight end who chose not to play in it. Um, you have a starting uh, – quarterback who started the lion's share of the year he wasn't playing it your second leading rusher um all these other things and you begin to think of you know oh woe is me woe is me i you know this isn't the way i envisioned it um and then you got to take a step back and say this is what i've been challenging all of these players for to do this for so many years and to continue to you know look at what challenges you have and not use them as an excuse, but use them as a motivation. And uh, it was time for me to pony up. It was time for me to um, uh, live up to maybe uh, uh, some of the own uh, same some of those same messages that I've been saying.